Hi, I am Diane Rose, Vice President of Volunteer Programs at FORCE. I have the distinct pleasure and privilege to work with our volunteer team of over 300 men and women. In my role at FORCE, I coordinate and train consumers for involvement in all aspects of research advocacy, including preparing volunteers to participate as consumer reviewers for peer review. Volunteer training includes recognizing health disparities in research and working to overcome these barriers through their involvement in the research process. Increasing diversity in research participation is critical to our community and the larger cancer community as well. And as you'll learn in this session, having broad participation in research, including people from all backgrounds, including racial, ethnic, gender, cancer stage, mutation, and personal experiences helps ensure that our research findings apply to everyone. Now, I would like to introduce you to our panelists. Dr. Verinda Jones joined City of Hope in 2015 as an assistant professor in the Department of Surgery, specializing in breast surgery. Dr. Jones earned her undergraduate degree with honors from Stanford University before receiving her medical doctorate with honors from Mahari Medical College in Nashville, Tennessee. While in medical school, she was inducted into the Alpha Omega Alpha National Medical Honor Society. Dr. Jones continued her postdoctoral training at Baylor University Medical Center in Dallas, Texas, with a categorical general surgery internship and residency. At Baylor, Dr. Jones was honored as Chief Resident of the Year. In 2014, she completed a breast surgical oncology fellowship at Emory University. Board certified in surgery, Dr. Jones is the recipient of several honors and awards. She holds active memberships with several professional societies and is heavily involved in community outreach, speaking frequently at numerous events across Southern California. Her focus of her research is investigating which genes make certain breast cancers especially aggressive especially among underrepresented minorities. She aims to develop drugs that work better than the current standard treatments for these populations. And additionally, she partners with universities in the surrounding area to develop methods to treat breast cancer in a minimally invasive way. Welcome, Dr. Jones. Debbie Denardi's journey started in June 2010 when she detected a lump during a self-exam. She was only 48 years old. Due to a family history of multiple cancers, including breast cancer, that took the life of her mother at age 44, Debbie's oncologist recommended genetic testing, which revealed she was positive for an inherited BRCA1 gene mutation. After a diagnosis of triple negative breast cancer, multiple treatments and surgeries, she is cancer free. When Debbie was 35 years old, she was diagnosed with basal cell carcinoma on her lip. She had surgery and the tumor was completely removed. That same year, she had colon surgery to remove a few polyps. These experiences encouraged her to learn and advocate for the hereditary cancer community. Debbie is passionate about encouraging everyone or anyone with a family history of cancers to get genetic testing so they can avoid going through what she had to experience. She is a volunteer and board member of FORCE, and she volunteers with many organizations to advance research for hereditary cancer patients. She also works to improve access to care for our Latinx community. She is a 12-year survivor and the mother of two sons, Michael, 25, and Alex, 27. Welcome, Debbie. Thank you. And Winora Johnson is a three-time cancer survivor of colorectal, endometrial, and basal cell carcinoma. She's a volunteer research patient advocate and Navy veteran. As a volunteer with various organizations, she shares her understanding of policy, research, genetic testing, hereditary cancer, patient engagement, and clinical trials with patients and the healthcare community. A Lynch syndrome patient, Winora advocates for genetic testing and awareness. She serves on several panels and review boards to provide extensive feedback on her role as a patient and research advocate with organizations such as CAP, the College of American Pathologist, Clinical Trials Curator for Fight CRC, FORCE, a research advocate, peer navigator and board member, a consumer reviewer for the Department of Defense peer-reviewed cancer research program, 
a PCORI ambassador and clinical trials panel member, IRB for local community hospital, an NRG oncology patient advocate committee member, and the AACR Scientist to, to Survivor Program, presenting a poster on financial toxicity and disparities among minority patients, and a National Quality Forum Cancer Standing Committee member. She has written various patient advocate blogs and participated as a guest speaker and panelist. Winora works in administration in the greater Chicagoland area and enjoys reading and traveling with her family. Welcome, Winora. So let's begin the session, um, which is gonna be a Q&A with our panelists. And the first question is for Dr. Jones. We hear how important it is to include a diverse group of participants in research studies. Dr. Jones, can you share why? What happens when research studies don't have diverse participants and how does that affect the research findings? Do you have any examples that you can share? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you again for having me here. It's an honor um, to be speaking on this panel. Um, so it is extremely important to have diversity in clinical trials because it's through these clinical trials that we are designing and developing the next wave of medications and therapies for cancer patients or all patients really. And when we don't have adequate representation, we may end up coming up with therapies that aren't best for everyone. And so we don't want to develop a set a, a group of therapies that don't work for a certain population. And then we don't know until it's, it's already been FDA approved and, and you know, being given. An example of this is breast cancer treatment for um, in African Americans. So when we think about the chemotherapy agents that were developed, they're wonderful, but they do have quite a bit of cardiotoxicity or, or, or injury that can happen to the heart in black patients. And that was understudied in the clinical trials that developed those drugs. And so it's important for everyone to be represented as we develop these drugs, one, so that we make sure we're making the right drugs for different patient populations, but also ensuring that we don't ignore potential adverse side effects that could happen to a certain population because of certain patient related factors. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for Winora and Debbie. What do you tell people you meet from the patient community about participation in research? Is your message one of caution or reassurance? And Winora, we'll start with you. Well, I like to start out by saying that representation matters. And I'm going to give two analogies or examples where that's uh, been a difference outside of the medical one. So, for example, years ago, um, the, when seatbelts were first being tested, they were tested using crash dummies, which were basically designed for male bodies. And do you believe it wasn't until 2019 that they decided to change, change that to female crash dummies, even though the proportions are still off? It still, it still begs to the fact that we as women are, are suffering higher risk of injuries and in crashes compared to men just because of that, that difference alone. And then another example, I'm going to go back to the early 2000s, getting out of the 90s. For women of color who have fuller hips and curvier backsides, jeans just didn't fit us appropriately. And um, in 2002, a famous hip hop um, star named Nelly created Apple Bottom, and they were designed for women who were curvier. So again, showing that representation matters. It's an, it's in important embedded part of our life so that everyone is feel is feeling um, inclusive to this matter. Thank you. And Debbie? Well, just to build up on what Dr. Veronica uh, mentioned, I wanted to uh, tell you a few things that I discussed with Latino uh, patients when I talk with them about clinical trials. The first thing that I mentioned is what uh, Dr. Jones said is that if we do not participate uh, in clinical trials, those medicines, they may not be applicable to us. They may not be as effective as we need them to be. So that is the first thing that I said to them. The second thing is that um, 
uh, in these days, we are having researchers include patients and just make it easier for them to understand based on the language, uh, just help them to understand it in Spanish if it's necessary. Also that I try to uh, break that um, misconception that we are guinea pigs because that is the way that it used to be for Latinos also and also for black patients that they would use them for research without explaining the benefits. So I try to explain that that is not what is happening today, that really there is a, uh, that we advance a lot in clinical trials. Also, another thing that they're concerned is about the expenses uh, needed to travel and get to clinical trials. So I tried just to find out whether or not expenses will be covered. Also, they are concerned about the technology that they need to have access to because sometimes they need follow-ups and they need to have some apps that they need to complete and everything. So also I try to find out and help them with that. And also the main thing that I tell them is that clinical trials usually is help for future generations. So really that is what really gets the point because in that way they can feel the reward of participating um, and helping future generations. Thank you. And Diane, can I add just a little bit to that too? Sure. It, was inter it was interesting. I came across this uh, um, magazine article, an inclusive research article from May 18, 2021. And it talked a little bit about inclusive design and the research that's requiring, uh, it says requiring us to understand the consequences of the decisions we make in reference to the researchers. We must take full responsibility of what we put out into the world. Good intentions don't matter when, when the technologies and experience we build inadvertently exclude certain groups of people, especially those from under uh, invested or underrepresented communities. So there's that intent, they know. And like what's mentioned in this article, good intentions don't matter. There needs to be follow through. Yes, that's a great point. Thank you for adding that in. And uh, Dr. Jones, same question. What do you tell your patients who ask you about participating in research studies? And do you initiate that conversation about participation in research studies or do you rely on the patient to ask questions about the options? Right, yeah, so I do encourage participation in clinical trials for all the reasons that have been um, stated by my colleagues here. I mean, it's, it's extremely important for um, patients to participate. And for that to happen, they have to know that the clinical trials exist. It is very difficult for clinicians to navigate the clinical trials that are available and to stay abreast of what is possible. And so to put that burden on patients, I feel is unfair. <laughs> That's my personal opinion. So I do initiate the discussion, not in a pressured situation, but so that they have all the information necessary to make the best decision for them. That is my whole goal as a clinician is to advocate for my patients and to empower them. And so I do bring up clinical trials whenever applicable um, and give them as much information as possible just so that they have all the resources necessary to make a decision. Great, thank you. Okay, now we're gonna move on to a question for Debbie and Lenora. As people with an inherited mutation linked to cancer, and also as research advocates, have you or other people you know with mutations had to make a medical decision only to be told there wasn't enough evidence or more research was needed in order to guide that decision-making? And has this influenced your commitment to research advocacy? And Debbie, uh, let's start with you. Okay, so what I'm going to share is my story and my family story that when I was diagnosed with cancer and then with a BRCA1 mutation, I sat down with my genetic counselor, with my oncologist, and they gave me all the information necessary for me to make a few decisions like having a double mastectomy, having a hysterectomy. Even even though it was scary, 
when they show me the probabilities of having a recurrence of breast cancer and having ovarian cancer, it was so high that I had to make that decision and I did. Then the laboratory uh, that did my genetic testing offered to do it with my family and they tested my sister. My sister also tested positive and their recommendation was the same. Just to, she was a pre viver and the recommendation was doing the uh, mastectomy hysterectomy. She went to her gynecologist and she showed her the, uh, she showed him the report and he said, well, I think it's very aggressive. I wouldn't do the hysterectomy. I would wait. She already had three kids and that was his decision. So then I said, well, let's go for a second appointment. And I went with her. I took the report. I explained everything, her chances and everything, because I was a little more knowledgeable, because I, I had to go through genetic counseling. And the doctor said, well, if you put it that way, I will do the hysterectomy. So my conclusion and my recommendation that you have to be your own self-advocate and also you have to help your family members to advocate for the care that they need for uh, our diagnosis of hereditary cancer. Thank you. And Monora? Well, that's that's great to know, Debbie, that uh, you were there for your family. And, and that's important uh, for all of us is to show up for each other when we can. Um, my experience, I can't really say, you know, even though I've had three cancers that I've had a really bad experience. I can just say that I had a really great oncologist who suspected that I was Lynch syndrome, had me tested, encouraged me about preventive care. And I'm here today to be able to talk to you about it. So one of the things I would just do is encourage uh, individuals to have a really good relationship with your with that doctor so that you don't run into any roadblocks. And, you know, unfortunately, one of the things that we kind of do as women of color sometimes is we're that matrix of the, of the family or, or so, and we, we don't want to act like there's nothing wrong. And so I wanted to break that cycle of not telling my kids you know, that, you know, mom's sick or grandma's not, you know, feeling well. I wanted them to know the truth and know the truth behind the history of uh, that we have Lynch syndrome, that this is something that's deadly and needs to be uh, watched and cared for. Thank you. <clears throat> and Dr. Jones, we hear from some constituents who are afraid to participate in research because they don't want to be experimented on or receive a placebo instead of the standard of care. How do you respond to these concerns? And certainly safety features are built into clinical trials and research. What can you tell us about some of those safety features? Yeah, um, that's a great question. It does come up quite a bit. And, and I just want to say I love what both Debbie and Winora shared because it highlights both the need for advocacy and for a great relationship with your physician. So built into the question that you asked me is this sense of mistrust, right? I mean, and, and it's there for obvious reasons, good reason. Um, it needs to be addressed head on. And so I actually really appreciate when patients ask me that question because it shows that they are willing to be vulnerable with me, tell me what they really think so that we can address that mistrust that has been there historically and from lived experience with the medical system and it needs to be addressed. Um, research is um, answering a question that is unknown, right? That is, that is inherent in research. And so with that comes the unknown of whether this treatment is going to work better than the standard of care. Um, and, and that is something that you have to accept a little bit to, to participate in the research. But as Debbie said, it is a way to give to future generations, right? We have to ask the questions, we have to do the research to get to the best treatment possible. And, and that's just something that um, if you have a good trust 
relationship with your physician and you know they're going to do the best thing possible for you and they're not going to subject you to a treatment they know doesn't work or, or you know, something like that, then I think that it's easier to walk through that decision making together and, and make the, the best decision for, for that patient. I will say this, and it probably is controversial for this setting, but the clinical trials are not for everyone, right? I mean, like Mm -hmm. we want everyone to be empowered to know about clinical trials, to make that decision for what's right for them and their family. But this is not to say that you have to say yes to the clinical trial. You, You do what you feel comfortable with, but inherent in that is knowledge, trust, you know, um, and faith and, and, and going forward confidently in your decision, whatever that is. Yeah, that's a good point. And that kind of leads into this next question. You know, we hear a lot about how people's situation can affect research participation. And so can you share examples of some situations that affect people's ability to even participate in research? This is for me. That's for Dr. Jones. <laughs> okay. I, you know, I, I actually think Debbie did a great job explaining some of those barriers earlier mm-hmm. in the talk and, and, and how she walks through, you know, this decision making with patients. I mean, there's transportation, there's costs, there's other um, obligations on your schedule. There's the side effects of the medication. Um, there are a lot of a lot of barriers that could be there with clinical trial participation and with a good community, as Renora said, how we have to be there for each other and social workers and kind of building up this team, both in the hospital and outside of the hospital can help overcome those barriers. Yeah. Okay, this question is for all three of you. Um, and we'll just take turns uh, with an answer. So we recently published an X-ray review that looked at pancreatic cancer treatment research studies and found that some of the requirements for participants are more likely to be barriers for people of color. What is your advice to researchers on designing studies to be more inclusive? And Debbie, I know you touched on this, but I think we can expand on it a little more. And um, Winora, let's start with you. Ooh, um, I I think it it definitely breaks down to language, the, the, the cultural understanding of when you're talking to a person, do you understand their background? And that's just going to be pivotal because you you don't want to be talking to a patient and they're just, mm-hmm, and they're nodding and they're, they really don't understand and they've blocked most of it out because they think it just doesn't pertain to them. So really, if you really truly understand your patients or the people who you will be servicing, it, it's going to require a, a cultural understanding of them. Debbie, anything to add? What you mentioned also, language is very important. Financial support is very important. Educating the patient on what is the objective of the trial, what they are going to get back when they finish, will they be sharing results? The patient wants to know, I'm going to participate. Will you share reports back? Will you report back to me? So really that is very important. And also usually what I encourage is that Um, researchers, they include young patients, they include not only patients that they live in urban areas, but also in rural areas. And most important, I think there are some statistics that, as you mentioned, the ACR, they did a, a, a study on disparities, and they realized and they reported in now in 2022, that 70% of the patients that participate are white. And only 2.5% are Black, 2.3% are Hispanics, and then others. We need to make them aware of those statistics just to make sure that they can reach out to the community and make sure that everybody is included so those results will be valid for everybody. Thank you. Dr. Jones, do you have anything that you would like to add? Yeah, I, um, this, is, um, this is definitely a problem built into clinical trial design, right? When we are designing clinical trials as researcher, we are designing them for kind of this optimal patient, if you will. So so people with comorbidities are excluded and and all of these factors that may disproportionately affect um, people of color. And so we have to go backwards to the researchers and educate how bias is introduced 
at every level. And as long as we're aware of it, we can try to um, account for it and get, and get rid of it in that eligibility criteria, right? What patient are you targeting when you're building your eligibility criteria? And just making sure that they're, that set is more inclusive. The, the exclusion criteria is not as limiting as it has been historically. And I think it takes educating researchers and, and organizations, um, research organizations to educate researchers on how they can start to exclude people and, and build in disparities in the design, right? We need to go back to the basics and make sure that we're keeping everyone in mind as we design the trial. Exactly. And Diane, I think, yes, go ahead. No, oh no, I was just gonna say, Dr. Jones hit it right on the head and, and, and probably just couldn't have said it better. And I appreciate how force themselves are helping shape this research. I mean, if you even just go to the FORCE website and you click on about FORCE, you see the diversity, equity, inclusion that's there. And even in the mission statement, how it talks about we're training patients who are new to science to use their personal experience to help hereditary cancer research. So you're starting there, you're being a catalyst and, and helping researchers that they have a source to come to. And so I appreciate that about force and yeah, sorry for interrupting. You. <laughs> no, thank you. And that's exactly, you know, I was just going to add that too. You know, th this is the place that our advocates have at the table, you know, that we, we train them on these disparities and what they can do when they're, you know, in these conversations with researchers mm -hmm. to be able to bring the, this up in the study design piece so that till it gets to the patient, there's more representation you know, involved in this study. And, um, you know, that just leads into this next segment that, you know, at FORCE, we do have this opportunity to work with researchers, you know, and, and we've seen these barriers as well. And they can make it really hard for people from many different groups to participate and, and limit what we learn from options about people from these groups. And we've discussed it throughout this whole segment. So for example, we recently ran a survey <clears throat> for people with metastatic breast cancer and recognize that metastatic patients need more guidance on exercise recommendations and nutrition. At the same time, we noticed that many research studies on nutrition, exercise and quality of life exclude people with metastatic disease. So mm -hmm. this is just one of those examples where restrictions on who can participate in research can lead to lack of gu gu guidelines. And these are the patients who are, you know, asking for this information or who need it for their, you know, healthcare decisions. So let's go to the next question, Winora and Debbie. Without mentioning the name of a specific study, as research advocates, have you ever had the opportunity to speak out, to encourage a researcher to broaden their research study design, to maximize patient participation, and if so, what were the results? Were you actually able to influence the study design in a more inclusive way? We can start with um, we can start with Debbie. Okay, so I have two examples that I wanted to share. One, uh, it's a, re a research study that is being done for hereditary cancer and Latinas, whether or not they offer that uh, that test for Latinas. And I had the opportunity to work with the researchers to design the flyers, to design the recruitment uh, information, and also to go over the questionnaire. They asked me just to review the questionnaire, just to make sure, because it was going to be conducted in Spanish. And they wanted me to review it and make sure that the language was appropriate, that they would be able to understand the questions and everything. So that really then, when they finished all the interviews and everything, they were really very satisfied. They were really happy that I was able to participate and gave, give them guidance on how to conduct these interviews. And another example that I had that I wanted to share is one research that just came to my inbox saying, we're recruiting Latinos for this type of study and this and that. And I answered to the researcher, can you send the materials in Spanish? And they said, oops, we don't have that. So it was like, you are targeting a population 
and you don't have the materials. Oh, we'll get back to you. So they started working on the materials in Spanish and they send the materials in Spanish. We started the recruitment, etc. But then the next thing that I did, I went to their website and I started looking the names of the researchers and who were the, the we could say the researchers on that side. And do you know what? The other thing that I discovered that no patient advocate was in that team. So that is another mistake that we need to start cor to correct because they need to have a patient advocate to review the EMs, to review the questionnaires, to review anything and get feedback to the researchers. So that is my next mission, just to see if we can include a patient advocate in that team. So <laughs> those are the two examples that I wanted to share with you. Thank you. Winora? Well, I don't have uh, great examples that Debbie gave, but what comes to mind for me and the changes that I've seen lately have been the DOD uh, grants that are being reviewed. They have added the advocates voice or uh, the patient advocates involvement. We get the score, these grants, because they're pivotal to our life. And I've taken that that when I'm asked to review grants, any future grants, if there's no patient advocacy involved, I'm in essence, I'm telling them I'm wasting my time because my voice is, you're, you're, you're using my voice to say that you've included someone, but it's not inclusive in the study itself. And so it's given me a really great measuring uh, device to see uh, whether these are true uh, researching, researches that are taking place and, and how my voice can make a difference. And so I'm, I'm happy to see that. And yet, like Debbie said, there's, there's still work they need to do. Just mm -hmm. don't put it there and say, oh, I touched an advocate and you really, really haven't. Right, exactly. That is a great example. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Jones, in what ways have you been able to influence your own or your colleagues' research to be more inclusive? Yeah, so um, I participate in several different forums <laughs> to, to, to push for um, more diversity equity inclusion in, in research and just in practice. So I'm a practicing clinician and then I'm also a researcher. So um, just in my own organization, I've helped to expand the patient, the diversity of the patient population that we serve, right? So that's kind of the first step because if the patients aren't here, <laughs> if a diverse patient population is not present at the hospital or at the cancer treating facility, then how are they going to get on the clinical trials, right? So we have to even go backwards and make sure that we're providing equitable care to people. And then from there, once people can get in the doors, then definitely um, talking to researchers that participated in, in lots of lots of initiatives to kind of expand the diversity that we have in our, our clinical trials and also in, in different um, national organizations. Um, besides that, you also get to, like Nora said, write grants and participate in review of grants. And that is another way to help ensure that research is becoming more inclusive is by getting on like study sections and, and things like that. So um, I, I think all of those ways can help diversify the patient or the, the I don't want to call subject population, but the, the patients on the clinical trials, but, but we do have to start with being more inclusive in our care. So just wanted to add that in there. Thank you. So I, I would just love to thank the three of you, our panelists, for participating in this session. Um, and I'd also like to give a shout out to our partners at Tiger Lily with their Tiger Trials and Inclusion Pledge, Touch with their When We Trial Initiative, the National Alliance for Hispanic Health, the Metastatic Breast Cancer Alliance with their MBC Connect Registry, and the many other organizations and investigators working to make research more inclusive. And at FORCE, we collaborate with researchers. We promote research studies enrolling people with inherited mutations, and we encourage our entire community to participate in research if it's possible. We also train volunteers like Debbie and Winora and others to participate in the research design process. And you can visit facingourrisk.org backslash research 
for more information on FORCE's research efforts. And so with that, just one more time, I'd like to thank you all again for being part of this panel discussion and sharing such wonderful information with our community at this conference. And, um, and thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you.